Welcome. My name is Miriam Gentle, and I am the pastor at Northwest United Protestant Church in Richland, Washington. Welcome to our service today. It's a rainy day in the Tri-Cities, and I think that's a welcome thing. Given our last days, we've had 100 plus degrees weather and very dry, so I am welcoming the rain. Always wonderful to, to have a little bit of humidity. Today's service, we will continue our study of the letter of James. We've been going through it slowly, and I hope that you are getting some good information from our messages. And, of course, I'd like to remind you that on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock Pacific time, we have our Bible study on the message that you hear on the Sunday before. So you are welcome to join that. And if you need the information, the Zoom link, please reach out to the church office, and we will provide you that information. Another few announcements. Next week, we will have our drive-in service here in our parking lot. And we had such a wonderful experience last time we gathered together. We want to do this again. And hopefully, we will, continuing forward, have more drive-in services. Uh, we will work on the logistics of that, and hopefully we can have everyone gather in the parking lot, in their cars, for a continued service. Next week, also, for that drive-in service, we are continuing our food pantry donations, so please remember to bring your canned goods, your boxed, packaged goods. No glass, please, as these are breakable and um, would not be a good contribution, but anything else, please consider donating to the food pantry. We have uh, joyful news that Camden has uh, made it to Houston, so we will continue prayers for Camden and his family. And if you have prayer concerns, please reach out to the office, or if you're on Facebook at this moment, you may put your prayer concerns and we will make sure that we lift up those names in prayer. Before we begin our service, take a moment to gather your elements for communion. So when we come to that time, you may commune with all the rest of us at the same time. Bread, crackers, donuts, bagel, whatever you have on hand. God welcomes all during that time. So at this moment, let us enter into worship by gathering our hearts and minds and focusing, focusing on God. Let us enter into worship. God anointed Jesus to console the afflicted. Come, let us worship Christ, our comforter. God anointed Jesus to emancipate the enslaved. Come, let us worship Christ, our liberator. God anointed Jesus to bind up the wounded. Come, let us worship Christ, our healer. God anointed Jesus to deliver the troubled. Come, let us worship Christ, our savior. Our opening hymn, Creator God, Creating Still. <laughs> 
Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Open our hearts to a far-reaching compassion that extends around the world to the most obscure corners of this planet. Let us remember you are God of all people, the beautiful and the homely, the well-dressed and the naked, the poor and the powerless, the rich and the hungry, the ones who speak loudly and those who barely utter a word, the ones who have bodies of steel and those whose bodies are broken and bent, the very young and the very old. God of time and space, give us time to grow up in your spirit. Give us room to grow up in our faith so that our ears may hear the knock at the door, the cry for help, the whimper of weakness, the sigh of loneliness. And so our hands will reach out with the love of Jesus. Teach us the meaning of this kind of love, which knows no boundary and no second thoughts. We lift up the names of those in our congregation that are suffering illness. Bring them wholeness and comfort. We pray for our nation and for our world in the grip of a virus. May we come together to find ways to prevent the spread and to prevent more deaths. Gracious God, grant us wisdom to live in community and to be humble in our dealings with each other. We turn to you. Always guide our steps, guide our hearts, guide our words. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture reading today comes from James 2, 1 through 7. My brothers and sisters, do you the acts of favoritism really believe in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and fine clothes comes into your assembly, and a poor one in dirty clothes comes in, and you take notice of the one wearing the fine lens and say, you take a seat here. While the one with poor, you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be the rich in faith and to be the ones that love him? You have dishonored the poor. This is not the rich who oppress you. Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme excellent name that was invoked over you? So was the end of the reading. Jim Wallace, a preacher, author, and founder and editor of Sojourners, a faith-based journal, <clears throat> tells a wonderful story about the time he discovered a Bible full of holes. During his first year in seminary, Jim Wallace and a few other first-year seminarians were curious about the word poor, poverty, poverty, 
and how often it appeared in the Bible. So they looked through the Old Testament and the New Testament for every single reference to poor people, wealth, poverty, injustice, oppression, and the responses to all of those situations as people of God. Do you know how many verses they found? Take a guess. Thousands. Thousands. <clears throat> so Wallace and his friends found out that one of every 16 verses in the New Testament is about the poor or the subject of money. So again, they were overwhelmed. Now surprisingly, none of them remembered a single sermon on that subject, poverty, the poor, wealth, offered in the churches where they grew up. Then they had an idea, a brilliant, crazy idea. With a pair of scissors and an old Bible, they began the long process of cutting out every single biblical text about the poor. Now, it took a long time. Like I said, there were thousands. And when they finally finished that task, that old Bible was so sliced up that it was so holy, H-O-L-E-Y, that it couldn't, it couldn't stay together. It was falling apart. It was a Bible full of holes. Now here's some of the verses that they cut out. And actually I thought about making my message just reading those thousand scripture verses and then I talked myself out of it. But if you want to, I could do that next week. Just put it in the comments. Anyways, here are some of those verses. From Exodus 22, you shall not oppress the poor or vulnerable. God will hear their cry. Leviticus 19, a portion of the harvest is set aside for the poor and the stranger. Job 34, the Lord hears the cry of the poor. From Proverbs 31, speak out in defense of the poor. From Isaiah 25, God is a refuge for the poor. Again, Isaiah 58, True worship is to work for justice and care for the poor and the oppressed. Matthew 25, what you do for the least among you, you do for Jesus. Luke 4, Jesus proclaiming his mission to bring good news to the poor and the oppressed. Luke 6, blessed are the poor for theirs is the kingdom of God. 1 John how does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's good and sees one in need and refuses to help? I could go on and on, but I think you get the picture. The subject of the poor and the oppressed and the way that, we, that God wants us to respond is an important, if not the most important subject that we can and should be discussing as a community of faith. So today we continue our sermon series, Faithful Living, on the letter of James. I titled the sermon, The Poor and the Powerless. After I did that, it occurred to me that it sounds like a soap opera title. <laughs> the Young and the Restless, The Bold and the Beautiful the poor, and the powerless. But this is definitely not a soap opera. It is a reality for so many people in James' world and in our world today. The second chapter of James begins with a strong word for us against discrimination of any kind, against favoritism, but especially discrimination based on social class. James writes, my dear brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really, really believe our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? 
If a person with gold rings and fine clothes come into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes but ignore the other, are you not making distinctions? Wow. How do those words make you feel? James isn't playing around. He, he isn't softening the message. He just goes right to the point. If you are choosing one over the other based on looks alone, it's not possible for you to say that you believe in Jesus. James is calling it acts of favoritism. Notice the word, the plural, acts of favoritism. But let's call it what it is, discrimination. Bible scholar N.T. Wright, in his book on James, describes one of his most embarrassing moments in church. It was Easter morning, and there was a long line of persons, a queue, as they say in England, a long line of persons waiting to come in and be seated before the service. So N.T. Wright joined the line. Soon he heard a familiar voice belonging to a very distinguished person with some clout. And this person called out, called out to N.T. Wright and, and proceeded to walk past the ushers, claiming loudly that he was Lord Smith, a synonym, uh, 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 not his real name, but you get the, the message here, Lord Smith. And could they please find a seat for my friend? Before he could even react, N.T. Wright was being ushered to the very, very front of the church to one of the best seats in the sanctuary. N.T. Wright tells this story saying he realized how close to the story in James his experience was. The usher reacting to the very distinguished gentleman and his guest quickly moved them up to the front of the line and to a fine seat while so many others were still waiting in line. He certainly felt the sting of James' words at that moment. His experience was an act of favoritism right out of the letter of James. In verse 5 of chapter 2, James continues to make his point about discrimination, and he says, listen, listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? This, this is a key verse for James, and, and it's a key verse for us as we move forward in our study of the letter of James. Now remember that James defines religion as Religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress. And so James is telling us that religion isn't just about our belief in God. It's about acting on what God would have us do. And how do we know? How do we know what God would have us do? Look at the scriptures. Look at the scriptures. Look at that holy Bible, H-O-L-E-Y, where all the references to the poor and oppression and poverty and the marginalized, those are all cut out. In the mid-20th century, there was a theological movement called liberation theology. Now, this theological movement, this thought, sought to relate thinking and doing, hear the words of James, the thinking and the doing, the orthopraxy and the orthodoxy, doing and thinking in ways that were grounded in scripture. Like that holy Bible with missing scriptures, I suppose you can call liberation theology a holy theology, H-O-L-E-Y, because those very same verses that were cut out of that Bible were the ones that were looked at carefully by the communities of faith that were poor and marginalized and discriminated against. 
the very, very communities that James is talking about in his letter. So liberation theology sought to hear the voices of the people that were experiencing the very thing that had been cut out from the Bible and not spoken of from the pulpits. The phrase, God's preferential option for the poor, God's preferential option for the poor, was first articulated by Gustavo Gutierrez, a Jesuit priest, in his book, A Theology of Liberation, written in 1971. Gutierrez writes that this concept of a preferential option for the poor is rooted in both the Old and the New Testaments. Ultimately, he wrote that a preferential concern for the physical and spiritual welfare of the poor is an essential element of the gospel. Now, I know I'm going a little bit too seminary professor on you at the moment, but bear with me because this is important stuff. And I stand behind it. And, and as Christians, you should too. Liberation theology, all it is saying is listen to the voices of those people that are actually living out in these poor and poverty. Listen to them. What are their stories? And, and when they read the Bible and interpret the scriptures in their communities of faith, is it the same as if you maybe middle class or, or in a different setting or context, are reading the same scriptures. And then what happens when you get together, do you get together, and talk about the scriptures? Can we learn from each other? Ultimately, that is what this liberation theology thought was. It's like, can we learn from each other if our context, if the places that we live if our social class, our economic class, and race, et cetera, are different, can we come together and study the word and, and learn from each other? An important note here, the phrase God's preferential option for the poor does not mean that God does not love everyone else. Please hear that. Please hear that. It doesn't mean that God just loves the poor and the rest of you will. No, God loves us all. It doesn't mean that only the poor find favor in God's eyes. It means that it means that there's a reason why this subject is so prevalent in the Bible. It's not an either or. Like I said, God loves us all. What it means is that God's heart is with the vulnerable, the weak. The people that just don't get a break for whatever reason. It means that sometimes circumstances in life that cause poverty are not the fault of that person or that group. There are layers of meaning in that statement, and I hope that we can discuss this further in our Bible study. Liberation theologians, and my friends, you are theologians. We are all theologians. That's just a fancy word for someone who thinks about God, talks about God, studies what God says in the scripture. So yes, you are theologians. Claim it. But liberation theologians specifically are asking the question, what happens when you look at the Bible through the eyes of the poor and the vulnerable? And can we engage in a dialogue with the scriptures and allow the voices, those voices, to speak to us? And I believe that we must. Now, there are so many verses about taking care of the poor, the weak, in the Bible. And as Christians, we ought to pay attention. There's some strong words for all of us. And in James chapter 2, verse 6, he says, You have dishonored the poor. You have dishonored the poor. I hear that, and I'm convicted. We dishonor the poor when we don't realize that poverty is a condition contrary to the will of God. We dishonor the poor when we, as Christians, don't do everything possible to work against poverty. We dishonor the poor when we don't see real people behind the statistics and statistics 
numbers about poverty levels in our nation and in our cities and our communities. We dishonor the poor when we don't look at our budgets, at church budgets, city budgets, our nation's budgets as moral and ethical documents. We dishonor the poor when we don't listen to Jesus. When we don't listen to Jesus' words in Matthew 25, whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. So how can we, followers of Jesus, take care of the least of these? The letter of James reminds us that real faith involves real action. To the least and the hungry, to the homeless and the downtrodden, authentic Christians live authentic love. Author Anthony DeMello tells a story that I think really makes his point. He writes, on the street I saw a small girl, cold and shivering, in a thin dress, with little hope for a decent meal. I became angry and I said to God, why? Why did you permit this? As I continued to walk down the street away from this little hungry girl, God replied quite loudly in the consciousness of my soul. God said, I did do something for that little girl. I did do something about her hunger and her care. Responded the Almighty, I made you. God has made you and me to do something. So don't walk around with a holy Bible, <laughs> a holy Bible with missing scripture verses. Instead, become the embodiment of those very verses that call us to be hearers and doers of the word. Amen. God is at work in the world, renewing, remaking, resurrecting, bringing hope through faith, through our gifts, and through the work of the church. We trust in God, and together we work for peace and justice through God's spirit as we offer our tithes and our gifts. Let us rejoice in our God-given opportunity to share in God's work. Let us pray. Almighty God, giver of every good and perfect gift, teach us to give to you all that we have and all that we are, that we may praise you not with just our words, but with our whole lives. Amen. Amen.
open to all, to all who seek to follow Christ's way. Come to this table to be filled with God's mercy and to find an assurance of God's enduring love for you, a love expressed in the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Let us now break bread together in communion with Christ and with one another. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to the table today, let us humble our hearts and open them wide to receive the blessing and the love the Lord has left us in the shedding of his blood and the saving of our souls. Let us reach out during these times, what's going on in the world, and help the people out there that are hurting. It is our call. We ask these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread. After he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took a cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples and he said, This, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we gather weekly and we remember Christ until he comes again. Let us partake all our welcome. Gracious God of every time and place and nation at your table, we have received the symbols of your grace, your hope, and your sustenance. As you have fed us, you call on us to help you feed the whole world, body, mind, and soul, with good works of justice and healing. Thank you for that opportunity. May we go from this worship service refreshed and renewed, having drunk deeply from the cup of courage that we might confront all those things that hurt those whom you love. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage. Keep us always faithful to you and active in our service. In the holy name of Christ we pray, amen. Our closing hymn is Fill the World with Love. <laughs> 
Friends, thank you for joining us today in this worship service. I hope you found the words meaningful. I also hope you found the message challenging. Remember, you're a theologian. You have to think those heavy thoughts with me. <laughs> and I share that with you in all good spirit. At this time, again, I want to thank my crew that has so lovingly and willingly joined me to make this service possible. I am grateful for them. I am grateful for each of you that continues to support this church, that continues to support the ministry of this church in this community and beyond. And now may the deep peace of Christ be with you. May the strong arms of God sustain you. And may the power of the Holy Spirit strengthen you now and always. Amen. Amen.